Caitlin, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me, truly. I feel completely honored. Big fan. Love your podcast. Thank you. And I love yours. And I want to talk about that. But first, Caitlin, if I had like grown up in a hut in none of it territory, which, yes. am I saying that correctly? You are, yes. As a Canadian, <laughs> all right? Without any exposure to the outside world, how would you describe the hugely successful franchise that you have been a part of? Like the Bachelor franchise? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, my gosh. That is a hard question. Basically, it is a world where you bring in some of the most, I don't know, beautiful, controversial, dramatic people into one home for all of these women to date the same guy and see who has the best connection. And basically, in the outside world, if you were to take a bunch of couples from the street, the ratio would probably be similar to the success rate of the show The Bachelor. So you do all the steps of dating. It's just on steroids. So you, you know, you have the first like flirting moments, getting to know each other, having the deep conversations, meeting each other's family, sleeping in the same bed overnight, then meeting your family and then getting down on one knee and doing all of that. So it's basically how to find a husband. So this took place like 300 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is really a wild world. I am a huge fan of both franchises. But what is also so interesting to me is like the environment that's created, the stuff that we don't see, of course. Yeah. But I imagine not having your phone, not having access to the outside world for uh -huh. like the first time in your life. Yeah. And having like the trophy be a person mm -hmm. and like the insecurities. I imagine that you have to have some kind of fucking mental survival skills. Honestly, I think I went in at the perfect time because I went through like the most rock bottom breakup of my life when I was like, I don't know, 26, 27. That was when I started my therapy journey. And I swear doing like so much therapy every week for two years set me up to go on the show where I walked into that mansion full of beautiful women and I was truly the most confident I had ever been in my life. And that was ripped from me in like seconds because I was no. like, because what fun is that to watch a confident woman in a dating scene? Of course, that's not good TV. So yeah, it ended up just being really hard. It's really hard. It's definitely edited for like the dramatic effect, but you're still competing. And I had to really like take a step back at one point in my life and go, wait, am I wanting this guy because he is the prize and I'm super competitive? Or do I actually like feel love for this man and can see myself with him? And the answer was I was being super competitive. I totally get that because it's also like I was telling my husband the other day, like if you transcribed The Bachelor. I uh know. -huh. It's a little different with The Bachelorette, I think. But if you transcribe The Bachelor, it feels like the total vocabulary is like 250 words. Yes. Amazing. Journey. Yep. Right reasons. Yep. All the things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the vagary of like, I could really see myself starting to have feelings for this person. I know. It's like we're reading a <laughs> script almost. Like, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in Iowa. And Iowa is the perfect place to fall in love. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, well, first of all, do you still watch everything? I mean, I think you do, do because you're like embedded. You're <laughs> like our queen. <laughs> Thank you. But do you think that you're a more skillful viewer than like the average person? Yes, because not only did I get to go as a contestant on The Bachelor and then be The Bachelorette, but I peeked a little more behind the curtain as the host for two seasons. So I feel like I really watch from a different lens and it makes it incredibly difficult because in that host role, I was like, I can't do this because I know too much and I want to save them. And I want to like step in and say like, don't keep that guy. And like, I actually find myself as a fan and as someone that like knows the ins and outs of it. So it's really hard. But wait, so with your experience as the Bachelorette, having kind of like been torn, I mean, not to put it like crudely. Yeah. First runner up on your season of The Bachelor? Third. Third. Yeah. So there was three girls left. And I actually at that point thought I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy's so in love with me. Like, he's obviously going to pick me. And then he sent me home and I was like, what? And that's when then they made me The Bachelorette. Did it feel like the blow that we see? Yes. It does feel like that. It's more of like humiliating 
because you also are having an out of body experience. Like I've been a fan of the show for so long. So to see Chris Harrison walk up and be like, Caitlin, I'm so sorry that you did not get. I was like, wait, I'm in that moment right now. I'm that girl. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I imagine it's truly like four in the morning yeah. and your feet are like dying. This one, we were in Bali and we weren't allowed to wear certain things because of the temple. So your hair had to be in a bun and you had to wear a sarong and like a blouse. And it was like two in the afternoon and I had accidentally just peed on my leg because there was no toilets and I had to like straddle over a hole in the ground. And I was like finding humor in everything. And then it was like, Caitlin, I'm so sorry. You did not receive the final rose. Please say your goodbyes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> So was like becoming the bachelorette. I mean, I imagine that that is essentially like a coronation. <laughs> and I imagine that you're treated with a whole different kind of protection, essentially, right? Yeah. Okay, wait, I love it that you're like, no, 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 maybe the perception is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> well, only the fact that like, protected. I always go back and forth with that because I'll never forget one of the producers sat me down one time and he goes, Caitlin, our one job is to make you look good and you're making our job really hard because I kept like breaking the rules and trying to break out and trying to see the guys oh, off God. camera and do all this stuff. So in a sense, they had to protect me as their lead, but my heart and my brain did not feel protected at all. It felt quite manipulated. So it's like this weird balance of, yes, protected in one way, but... I can totally relate to that as an actor. Yeah. That feeling where it's like, you're treated with a lot of fragility uh -huh. because they can't, like, rock the lead's boat. You'll lose money in right. production days or whatever. And you want to make sure that they feel good. But at the same time, you feel raw and exposed. Yeah. And if there is something like that, like, okay, we need you to go to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> like, we got you a gym membership. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Right. You almost want... At least at my age, I'd want more and I'm able to ask for it now. And I seek it out like just more direct communication. Yeah. Otherwise, it feels like kind of patronizing. It was such a learning lesson for me because like for you, I'm sure you've gone through so many different phases and like seasons of your acting career and learning as you go and growing and evolving as an actress. And then for myself, I felt like I was like thrown in, shoot up, spat out. And I was like, wait, what? But I've learned so much. So where if I do TV again, I'm like, okay, I would ask for this and I would be like cautious of this. And it was so eye opening. And I'm assuming you might have felt like that at the beginning, but you learn so much as you go that you're at a place in your life where you're like, I know what to ask for now and how to protect myself. Yes. Like I can now go up to a director and say like, was I too heavy handed? Is this moment not mine? Mm. Or like, do you want me to do my nails? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, help me help you. I got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, will you tell us about your engagement? Yes. Being engaged for the second time is interesting because the first time was obviously from the show and it was like a whirlwind and I really thought it was going to work and then it didn't. Did you really like... I love that. Oh, I really thought it was going to work. That is a heartbreak, though. It was. It really was because that show's success rate is obviously not right. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to be like a successful story. And how crazy that I went through all of this to find the person that I was going to marry. And yeah, it just never got up. We were together for three and a half years. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also a shit ton of public pressure. Yeah. And like we had both never experienced that before. So it was very new to us. We felt a lot of pressure. It was also like a terrible, shitty foundation to start a relationship on because I've obviously been like dating all these other guys. So then being engaged the second time, I'm like, first of all, I never thought I would get married in my whole life. I never dreamt about my wedding. I was never like, I'm going to get married. I'm <laughs> totally with you. Oh, and really? I'm now on my third and final marriage. See, there you go. <laughs> but now I get that. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's no shame around divorce, around being engaged the second time, because I'm like, hey, and if it happens a third, I'm not saying everyone's going to be like, oh, God, she's hinting a breakup. But to me, I'm like, who cares? Who really cares? Yeah, I so appreciate that. I'm like, shouldn't I be commended for being like a romantic and getting back on that horse? <laughs> In my opinion, it is. And I feel like we're just so pressured by, you know, people on social media or certain people that are trying to follow this blueprint. 
And what if that doesn't make you happy? Why shouldn't we be commended for getting out of something that made us unhappy and trying something again? Like, I think it's beautiful. Caitlin, you mentioned earlier about your breakup before you joined the universe. (laughs) Yeah. But will you tell us about that? Like, how did that end? And how did you kind of get back on your feet? Well, it was still to this day, probably the roughest time of my life. How long was the relationship? It was three years. So he played hockey. Oh, athletes. Uh, They'll get (laughs) you. And I still believe to this day that I actually had a good one. I would say 95% of athletes scare the hell out of me. And I believe I had someone that was like such a good person still to this day. And so it was kind of tough because I was at a place in my life where I had to make a decision. I didn't get education. I graduated high school and then I didn't go to college. I thought I was going to dance my whole life. I was like, I'm going to be a dancer and travel the world. And I realized I wasn't good enough to do that. And so I was like, okay, I'm working at a restaurant, trying to make it as a dancer, teaching the spin. And I was like, this is the guy I'm going to marry. So I might as well go with him on his journey. You know, he's a hockey player. So he had to go. And he was like a free agent. So he's getting traded and he's going here and he's going there. And oh, my gosh, he got a bad injury. So we ended up in Germany. And what happened was over that time, it's such a fragile place in your life to try and be deciding, like, what do I want? But you're not thinking that way at 25. You're like, well, he wants this and I'll be here for him. And it's like dating an actor in the sense of like the constant uncertainty. Yeah. The stakes feel really high. Yeah. And you're put in a position of caretaker. Yes. Yes. And I completely lost myself along the way. I didn't even really have friends because I couldn't speak anybody's language in Germany. I couldn't get a job. He was always on the road. I did not want to ask for money. So I would like get my own little phone plan that like ran out and I couldn't Google things at the grocery store. And I couldn't even hear people's conversations because I couldn't speak the language. I was so lonely and I felt like I had nothing to offer And I was a shell of myself. And I remember being like 97 pounds and depressed and like just not okay. And I think he kind of did me a gracious favor by ending it, even though at the time I was like, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Yeah. But I just couldn't live that lifestyle. And he knew that I couldn't. And it was obviously bringing him down and me down. And so he ended it. And I had no money. I had no job. I had no ambition or career or education. And I was like, what is the point? And it was so hard. So did you fly that? I flew to my parents. My mom and my stepdad were in Phoenix and I flew there immediately and lived at their house and slept on the couch. And I actually got like a little bit addicted to Valium because I would just numb myself. And it just got to a point where my mom was actually coming in at night and putting on a YouTube video of like hypnosis of like, you are okay. And eventually it got so bad, but it got better. This is like the beginning of a great (laughs) rom-com. You're like pulling the blanket over your head. Uh Your mom's like, the sun is shining again, honey. (laughs) Go outside. You're like, ah, it's never going to shine again in my heart. (laughs) That was me. It's like, Uh. I bet you're wondering how I got here. You know, that whole thing. That's like the start of my story. But again, it was just like over time, you have a choice where it's like, I can continue to live on my parents' couch or I can like get back out there and find a job, start working, like get back to my friends. You lived like the quintessential 20s experience. Yeah. Your emotions are still really raw, like a teenager's. Yeah. And then when you're in your 40s, Caitlin, you're just kind of numb. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a natural value. Yeah, that sounds great. I can't wait. I'm like two and a half years away. Can't wait. <laughs> Is everyone asking you about like wedding shit? Oh my gosh, yes. I was never a wedding person either. Yeah. And I've always felt like with my career, I've had kind of enough of my special moment that has been wonderful. Yeah. Like I can understand someone who really wants to have their wedding day be like their premiere, Uh essentially. Uh And I already felt like I had the good fortune of sort of experiencing some of those moments. And also just growing up like you, I wasn't even sure what my journey was. Right. right. In terms of marriage. (laughs) Yeah. But do you guys have like date and like, has it been stressful? No, good. Good for you. We don't have a date. And I go back and forth with, and this is where social media can be stressful because 
I'm such an open book and I share so much of my life with people through social media that I feel a little bit of pressure because I'm like, I've opened up and I've shared so much and I've talked about this engagement and I was so excited and then I bring everyone along with me and then I'm like, ah, people need to like stop putting pressure on me. And they're like, but you opened up your world to us. And I'm like, oh, that's true. And they just care. And the thing about Bachelor Nation and the followers, they're so loyal and they care so much. And sometimes that can come across as pressure and sometimes I can get frustrated. But at the end of the day, Jason and I have just not set a date. We've sat down so many times to like try and be like, okay, let's put together a guest list. And we both get stressed out and overwhelmed and then we're so totally. tired and we're like, screw it. It's a little bit of like a catch-22 because you start out, you need to like find the venue. In order to do that, you have to figure out how many people you want. So then the natural order is to start with a guest list. Yeah. And then it's like, wait, you want to invite your coach's cousin from yes. like, what? Yes. No. Yeah. Or it's like, ugh, like that person's going to bring a date and then that's an extra 150 bucks. I know. It's crazy. So I would suggest eloping. Tell Jason that because I would totally elope. He's the one that's thought about like the dream wedding. But I mean, now that we've talked about it and gone over like the guest list or the budget or he's totally into finances and budgeting and he's like, a wedding is so expensive. It's so expensive. <laughs> yeah. And I always say that like people kind of show their hand. Yeah. Like if they have like some kind of grievance, yeah. they're going to bring it to the table and it's annoying and then other people will kind of surprise you with their chillness and their support right but yeah i do think that weddings are just so tricky what i always like because we get a lot of callers who have wedding questions which mm. i love yeah like the biggest advice is getting on a plane the next day going on a honeymoon yeah the next day not putting it off especially if you have a big wedding or a sizable wedding there's like that december 26 if you celebrate christmas yes that feeling of like oh like, what now? Like, there isn't that thing That's that we're... That's true. It's like the happiness hangover. Yes. Yeah. Like, so many of our conversations have been focused around this massive party celebrating us. Yep. And our future. Yep. And so having that idea to, like, decompress something else to look forward to, I just think is really important. I still think, Caitlin, if I could plan a wedding for you and Jason, it would be to elope <laughs> to Tahiti. Like, maybe do it legally someplace. Yeah. Quietly, whatever. Elope to Tahiti. And have like a big country ranch hoedown yes. party with everybody. That sounds ideal. And honestly, the longer time that goes on, the more that sounds very appealing to both of us. Yeah, I think this is kind of just for you guys and how you guys want to proceed. So many people are like, if you guys wanted to get married, you would do it. Why are you finding so many excuses? And I'm like, it's not even excuses. It's truly just stressful. <laughs> And you guys are busy. Yeah, so busy. And it's easy to, if you have like a great support system, which is necessary, but it's hard to dedicate a ton of energy and money yes. into a big party for everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Honestly, eloping is sounding like right up my alley. Kaylin, where is your studio? I'm in Nashville. Do you love Nashville? I do. I love it. I lived in Canada like for so long. In Vancouver. Vancouver, right? yeah. Because I grew up in Seattle. So I'm like, oh, you did? Of that vibe. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. I love Seattle, but I've never been to Nashville and people love it. Yeah. It's a good time. The weather is bananas. Like yesterday it was 78. Today it's 42. Like it's just bananas, but it's such a fun city. Do you think of that as home? Yes, I would say this is just starting to feel like that now because I have been here now seven years, but Vancouver used to feel like that for me, but it really doesn't anymore. So I would say Nashville, yeah. Vancouver can be a cold city. I've worked there a few times and it can be cold in the sense of, you know, it's hard to make friends. Yes, which is so bizarre for Canada. I felt that same way. Yeah, and Seattle can be like that, too. Yeah, they call it the Seattle freeze. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are really polite, mm -hmm. but not warm. Yeah. Like, well, the first time I went to New Orleans, I was like, what is happening? I'm invited <laughs> to this stranger's, like, yeah. <laughs> crawfish boil. This is incredible. <laughs> yes. And I think it is really shocking when you've never experienced that before. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It felt like that where I grew up. But Vancouver, not so much. Like, I grew up in Alberta and then moved to Vancouver when I was 20. And Alberta felt like that. And then Vancouver didn't. And then I got used to that. And then I came into the South. And I was like, oh, so nice. Are you tired of your brand's message getting lost in the endless scroll of social media feeds? 
Get your message heard when your audience is really paying attention, like you are now, through podcast advertising with Acast. Our network of more than 92,000 shows reaches millions of engaged listeners worldwide every day. And you know what? Acast podcast listeners are more likely to make a purchase because they listen to the highest quality shows, and you can reach them on any and every listening app. So are you ready for your business to be heard? Create your own podcast advertising campaigns with Acast today by visiting go.acast.com slash advertise. Hello. Hi. I'm here with Caitlin, who I really want to be like her new best friend. You are. I adore you. (laughs) Kelsey, I adore you too. Thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? So I'm looking for some sperm. Um, (laughs) um, Well, I want to have a baby. So you are 37. Yes. And you really want to be a mom. Yeah. Which is, listen, there's no judgment at all in these questions. But does it supersede the idea of a relationship? It sounds like it does. Yeah. I mean, that would be ideal, but that's not something I feel like I need. Uh Great. Okay. So tell us your story now that we have a little bit of that context. I mean, I wanted a child. It was this past year that I decided, because I've always said like, oh, I want to be a mother, but it doesn't matter how I become a mother. But then this past year, I started to think I would like to have a baby and Period. I'm also a birth doula, so I'm around pregnant people and babies all the time. I love it that that makes you smile, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's great. I just want to create art and help people have babies. Like, that's what I want to do with my life. That's why I'm here on this rock flying through space. <laughs> and I would really like to do it. I've been in a relationship before where I helped parent a child, and it was really hard, but I really liked it. Do you have access to that child anymore? They're old enough now that we can text. Okay. So, that's so nice. occasionally we text like they're old enough now. Okay. But yeah, oh, that was hard. Like it was a while ago, but that was hard. I am single. Like the pandemic did not help with that at all. You're not alone. And I am trying to get back out there, but it's hard to meet people. I don't like the apps. They're awful. They're not fun. And I don't know, like, I still don't drink and like, I'm not somebody who like goes out a lot, but I've been going out more and doing more fun things. But it's also hard because I'm like, this is what I want to do. 37, which is not completely, you know, too old. Not at all. Okay. My own journey with like motherhood has been a little different. I wasn't even sure I necessarily wanted to have kids. My career felt very important to me. (laughs) I got pregnant at 35 after trying mildly for a year, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Interpret that however you will. (laughs) (laughs) I was really surprised about how I wouldn't say I enjoyed pregnancy. I was definitely counting the days, but I felt really good. I felt really like emotionally stable. There were surprises. And now I have like an awesome 10 year old. He was born at 31 weeks. My water broke at 30. So he was like three pounds and we did the whole, you know. Yeah. But he's awesome. And we're really lucky. And I feel really grateful. When I first read your letter, I was really thinking, I kind of hope I can convince her to use a sperm donor. Uh Mm -hmm. How does that register with you? I have friends who have done that, and it makes me a little bit nervous about them having so many siblings. That is something that makes me nervous and also is expensive. I mean, the sperm part, it's like $800 to $1,000 a vial, and they suggest doing it four times before doing IVF type stuff, and then that could be even more, right? I have friends that sent over $100,000 to make their family. Oh, it can be a fortune. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know. I mean, I also haven't gone to see a fertility specialist or anything like that yet. But I know what you mean, because if I want to do it alone, then I mean, I'm not trying to trap somebody or anything like that. I just feel like if your drive is to have a baby before you're 40, Uh I want you to have that. On the other side of this, Kelsey, our callers feel so much pressure to make big life decisions immediately. 
Mm -hmm. Like, should I get married? Should I quit my job? Should I move across the country? Like, how do I propel forward? Like somehow this other cloud came in that was like, make decisions right now. Yeah. I wish I could tell everyone it's okay. Like the train is just slowly leaving the station. But the we don't have to make these massive life decisions. Kelsey, I do understand that you are 37 and it may take a minute for you to get pregnant. Yeah. I don't want to discount that. Wait, mm -hmm. But Caitlin, what are your thoughts? I love listening. And Kelsey, thank you so much for sharing this with us too. Like it's so personal. And sometimes you need community and people to talk this through with to, you know, have a better understanding or idea or feel seen and heard. So thank you. I'm also 37 and I too want to have babies and I think about this stuff all the time. So when I was hearing your question and things that you've been feeling, I was like, oh, I can understand that. I'm engaged. So it's a different situation. But yeah, I've often thought that I could do it on my own before. So to me, obviously the expense thing, like that's something. But it was actually a question for you. Sperm donors can be artificially inseminated without doing IVF at a lower cost, right? And is that still what you're talking about? It's called an IUI. One of my friends, she did it herself, like so with a midwife. Like, yes. Is it like a turkey baster? Like, is that kind of? It is, but it, I mean, it's a lot smaller than a turkey baster, but she plunged it herself. So she inseminated herself. Yeah. And is that still expensive to do? Well, yeah, like the sperm, I think it was between $800 and $1,000 okay. from what she said. One time, like that's something that I feel is doable. Of course. But, you know, if it doesn't work, then doing it again, you know. Right. I would just have to save for it. Yeah. And I feel like you should just start with that. Like you already seem a little bit discouraged with it where it's like you can just start once and see, you know, what happens. Yeah. But also, is there a way to request a sperm that has only been used like X amount of times? I don't know. I mean, I think so. Because I know you're worried there would be like a lot of the siblings out there, but... I kind of feel like that's a non-issue. Yeah. To me, that would not be make or break at all because I would have my own very personal relationship and then kind of deal with that stuff as the kid gets older. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to be transparent about, hey, before you're intimate with somebody, like asking them, do you know if you have a sperm donor? Mm. Are you tired of your brand's message getting lost in the endless scroll of social media feeds? Get your message heard when your audience is really paying attention, like you are now, through podcast advertising with Acast. Our network of more than 92,000 shows reaches millions of engaged listeners worldwide every day. And you know what? Acast podcast listeners are more likely to make a purchase because they listen to the highest quality shows, and you can reach them on any and every listening app. So are you ready for your business to be heard? Create your own podcast advertising campaigns with ACAST today by visiting go.acast.com slash advertise. You know how we sometimes use different avenues to express our stress? And I always use the example of like the mother-in-law at a wedding wearing a similar color to the mother of the bride and like spinning out about that when really the heart of the issue is that she's just terrified of the change. Mm -hmm. That's just how I feel is that the sperm donor world, that person should be very separate, I think, from this important relationship. They made the decision to donate sperm for whatever reason, and that is totally fine. And you made the decision to utilize that to care and nurture for a baby. I'm wondering in your doula world, are there resources that you can tap that maybe you haven't yet? Mm -hmm. Because I do understand that there's some financial issue, you know, but you could reach out and get advice and ask some early initial questions about like, how do I make sure that I'm fertile without spending a lot of money? Like, can I take a specific drug that will help my fertility? Mm -hmm. I took a drug that I can't remember what it was, but it's been used since like the 70s. You take it at specific times during the month. There's like a 50-50 chance. This is what my doctor told me that it actually works. Or maybe she said there was a 50-50 chance I was going to have twins. Oh, if it starts with a C. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is relatively inexpensive. Maybe in your world, like, is there anyone you can think of with that kind of resource that you could cold call and say, this is something I really want to think seriously about? Because 
the finding a partner yeah. is a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like your focus is you want to experience motherhood. Oh, yeah. There are people, definitely. I mean, this is something that I've just started to talk about. And then I was like, well, a podcast is a really good way to like let everybody yeah. know that I, this is start something with that the I, actresses. <laughs> start with yeah. a podcast and then talk to a medical professional. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, you never know what doors that could open. <laughs> That's what I was telling my friends. I mean, like one of my friends was doing something somewhere and was telling somebody and then they were like, I think I want to, you know, have a child, but I don't have a, you know, and so she was like, let me know if you want to talk to this person. And so, you know, I mean, I'm like, maybe that way, you know, why not? I'm also like, I don't know. I mean, at this point in life, it feels like at least go have coffee with this fella. Maybe. Right? Yeah. If he wants to have a no strings attached baby with you. Or it's like if they want to like co-parenting with somebody that's not like you're in a relationship with. But even people who are married don't know how they're going to co-parent until right. they're a parent. And they're like, right. Yeah, they're a couple, but they have very different views and ideas. Yeah, that is common. I think yeah. that that is the majority very. of people. But yeah, no, I do have people that I can talk to about that. And I'm not totally against a sperm donor. I just was like, that would be a lot easier to just get pregnant by having sex. But that even hasn't been anything that's been happening very much. So I'm like, where is everybody? Do you live in a big city, Kelsey? Mm-hmm. I live in Nashville. Me too. Oh my gosh, hi. <laughs> There's something so kismet here. Also, one of my best friends is a fertility nurse, and I would love to even just have you have a conversation with her. Oh my God, this feels like yeah. getting chills. This is this no. is some weird, like, I feel like we were all supposed to have this conversation today. I'm getting a little goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. But Kelsey, you know what's interesting about, well, I mean, this is amazing. But what's also interesting about this, Kelsey, is that I was going to ask about your socialization right now. And I'll put this in context in terms of me. I quarantined hard. Oh, yeah. I did not see anybody. I puzzled my ass off. I was like, I don't need to act anymore. I'm going to knit hats for a living. Like my very few friends, because I'm the kind of person that has like two or three really close friends. And now Caitlin. <laughs> I was like, me too. And now you. Yeah. <laughs> but when I first started, even just going to the grocery store or something, all my interactions felt really awkward. Mm-hmm. And I felt like people were looking at me with like quizzical eyes. And I internalized that as like, God, I must have just said something really odd. Did I forget how to talk to people? Yeah, totally. I work at a health food store. And so I didn't get to like hide from people. So I was there out in the public. Okay, good. So you didn't have that problem. But the people you're seeing every day aren't the people that you care about that are your... I mean, I care about them as humans, but like your people... So sometimes you get full, like, I can't do anymore, but you're like, I didn't get connections today with, like, my people. But I've started to do more stuff. Good. Like, improv stuff. Cool. So, like, just getting out there and participating more in that community, too, because it's really fun. I used to act in lots of stuff, but I focus more on birth work now. It would have to be something that would fit in with that now. That's the way I view it now. I just wanted to make sure, because I do talk to a lot of callers that have not expanded in order to kind of combat that feeling of like loneliness or stir craziness or immediate decision making. I often give advice, which is like, how can you socialize in a way that makes you happy? How can you outside of work, you know, the idea of meeting new people, the idea of new stranger interaction. But it sounds like you feel good on that front. Oh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't seeing anybody for a while, you know, and then like having like more depressive time than you like don't invite people over that kind of stuff. And you're at a raw time right now. Yeah. Yeah. But I have been going out and doing stuff more. Good. I just get such good energy from you. And I feel like you're meant to be a mom. You're meant to do this. And I know the dating apps and everything are so painful, but have you ever thought about just being completely honest on one of them and saying what you're looking for? Or does that sound too scary? No, I haven't done that yet. I'm just starting to talk about it and be like, this is something that I want to do. 
But I have been talking to somebody about doing that. I need to get some new pictures. Yeah. I want to encourage you to do that. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin, I really sort of love this suggestion. You might get a lot of creeps, Kelsey. Yeah. But there <laughs> is nothing to lose if it's like this has been percolating in me for a long time. I want this experience. You know, yeah. Let me know your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> there are people out there that could, like you said, you already met somebody that you know wants the same thing and like go for coffee with that person, you know, like have those conversations. I mean, you just talking about it is putting it out into the universe. And it means that that's something that you want in your life and you're going to attract it somehow. But again, like same thing that we're saying is don't put so much pressure on yourself for it to happen like now. Yeah. Coming out of the quarantine. This is a raw time for you. I just want you to be so gentle with yourself. That was something I was talking to one of my friends about. It's like working on like healing some stuff. I mean, I just also moved. My space isn't even, it's like not even ready for me really, you know? So like thinking right. about oh. another person, you know? Yeah. So it's just like starting to tell people to think about like, this is something yeah. that I want to do. That's great. So then when people ask me about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, open to talk to people about it. Good. I'm glad that you're kind of at the beginning of this journey. Yeah. It's good to recognize that this is the little seed mm -hmm. that's slowly starting to be like watered and fertilized mm -hmm. and slowly starting to sprout. Yeah. No decision has to be made today. No decision has to be made in a month. Caitlin, if you're willing to give me the info of your fertility friend, if you think she would be a good resource, she would. I think that sounds great. Yeah, I would love to talk. I mean, it would also be helpful in just other stuff, too, just, you know, to talk to them about that. Because they might know, probably would know other things that obviously I don't know, especially since I'm new on this journey with myself. You might have to have some blood work done. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, she helped me with everything. I froze my eggs about five years ago. Good for you. Yeah. See, that's smart. I'm really happy I did that. That is not an easy journey. That's a lot. No, it was a lot. And she really helped me through everything. And she is incredible just to have a conversation with. And I know she would for you. Absolutely. That's so nice. Yeah. And we can just start it slowly. I totally agree with you with that. This is the very beginning of it. And my mom didn't have me until she was 38. She had my brother when she was 39. And I also am glad that I haven't had any children yet because I'm in such a better space than I was in my 20s. Yeah. Yes. Timing is everything. 100%. I felt that way. Yeah. Kelsey, I can't thank you enough. I will get the information from Caitlin and pass it along. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you so much, Kelsey, because you're not alone. Yeah. Like, I know that there's a whole lot of people out there that want to have kids that are feeling that clock and you have a lot of love to give and you want to be a mom. And that is glorious. Yeah. Yeah. Sending you a lot of love, Kelsey. Yeah. Thank you, Bug. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thinking of you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. What a sweetie. Caitlin, I'm just really so grateful that you came on the podcast and I really, really want to be your friend. Yeah, well, we are friends now. Good. You're stuck with me forever because I feel the same way. And I'm just so grateful that you had me on and I loved this past hour. I just feel a kinship with you. I feel like a bit of a nerd because I'm like, I can't stop smiling. Like, I agree. I just I'm so grateful for you. So thank you. And Caitlin, thank you for being so generous to our caller. Oh my gosh. I mean, that was like an extension above and beyond. When people show up so authentic and raw like that, I feel so much connection to people that do that because I don't find that very often, I guess. And so when people want to just like share something so intimate and be heard and seen, and I'm like, oh, I want to help her. Like it made me a little uh, emotional. Aww. So I just so appreciate and love you so much. Thank you again. I love you. Thank you. That was so wonderful. Bye, Caitlin. Bye. Bye.